Now I'm very happy to introduce Hendrik Meyer zum Felde, who will speak about Reclaim ID that is helping um, to build a self-sovereign, decentralized uh, identity system. So thanks a lot. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Hello. <clears throat> Hello, everybody. And first of all, thank you for making this speech possible. My name is Hendrik Marzen Felder, and today I want to present to you a tool which was developed at the institute where my colleagues and me work. Um, we work at the Fraunhofer ISAC. It's an IT security um, institute located in Munich, working in close relation with the Technical University of Munich. And um, my colleague Martin Schanzenbach is the leading programmer of Reclaim ID. And, um, Let's get started. But um, before I present the tool itself, I want to tell you something about the motivation behind the tool. So um, we all know identity providers. Most of us have may, may already have used some of these. And um, basically, if you think of things like Facebook or Google, it allows you to perform a login at other websites or services. And the first advantage of identity providers is, of course, um, comfort. You don't have to remember hundreds of passwords or user credential sets um, in order to log into a website, but you can simply use an identity provider instead. And you have the possibility to manage your identities at a single entity. And of course, people have, the, yeah, have, people have gotten familiar with identity providers. Another main advantage of identity providers is the liability, because um, some websites or some parties may suffer from legal issues, and it's easier to outsource the protection of identity data to an identity provider. And um, what you can see here is basi basically a, a scheme which um, shows uh, some measurements taken in the year of 2014 and 15, and it shows on the left-hand side what percentage of identities are stored at which identity provider services. And the main point that you can easily see is, of course, Facebook has about maybe more than 60% of all the identities that are used on the web. And it's followed by Google with about 20%, followed by Twitter with about 6% of the identities that are used to log into other websites, followed by Yahoo and LinkedIn and other small identity providers. And the main point, what you can see here immediately, is basically um, the market share of identities is highly focused on very few companies. So basically, um, Facebook and Google control more than 80% of the identities. Why is this an issue? Well, first of all, if few companies control whenever a user wants to log into a website and performs the login um, steps for the user, it's possible to use this information and perform targeted advertisement or perform steps to create opinion shaping. And on the other hand, in the context of this conference, it's of course clear this data can be used for mass surveillance and data collection, and this is an issue. Um, on the other hand, another liability risk is at hand because if one single identity provider like Facebook um, controls all the identities of the people, then basically there's a single point of failure. And if this company is hacked, it may suffer from an existential legal um, issue due to the general data protection regulation. And of course, um, another issue which is at hand is basically that an oligopoly may occur, which is basically a monopoly which is shared by, by multiple parties. So you may have the issue that too few parties have too much control over the market of identities. And so far, no federation is widely practically used yet. Okay, here's a quote. Everyone needs complete control over who they share personal information with at all times. Do you have any idea who said this? Okay, it was Mark Zuckerberg. Yes, and um, of course, it seems a bit ironic in the context of this conference, but what he meant was he wants users to have full control of their data within the realm of Facebook. 
but we want to break out of this realm of a third party that we want to trust. We do not want to trust a third party at this point. And uh, may, some of you, prob I mean, most of you probably already heard about stories like these. Um, just an incident, um, Yahoo, a couple of years ago, lost a billion credentials of users and um, some other incidents like the Facebook Cambridge Analytica scandal, these things just reveal that these things occur often. I mean that it's a real problem that we are dealing with here right now. Okay, so for the tool that we created, the primary objective is this. We want users to exercise their right for digital self-determination. We do not want to have a third party involved for the management of the identity or the data sharing. We want it to be open, free, and we want to use a decentralized service, service which is not under the control of a single organization or a business or something like that. And we want the software itself to remain free. And here comes the name. Basically, we want users to empower themselves to reclaim control over their digital identities. That's why the tool is called Reclaim ID. Okay, before we get further to the tool, um, it's important to understand what the purpose of an identity provider is. And basically, there are two different main areas. The first main area covers the following things. They are partly already mentioned. Um, First of all, you want to provision your identity to other services. You want to maintain control. You want to allow the management of the identities. And you want to be able to share your personal data with third parties. And you want to be able to update your information. And you want to enforce your authorization in the service that you're using. The second main part is about identity information verification and the attestation about it. For instance, you may have an email address and often at some identity providers offer an additional service just to attest the email that is used at hand. Or maybe some other service may say this person is actually living in Germany and this is a true fact, for instance. So these two main areas are covered by identity providers and Reclaim ID focuses on the first area. So we want to solve all the above, I mean, all the, all the tasks that are explained in the first set. And the second part is not yet our department, but we are working on it, and I will get to that point later on. Okay, time to introduce Le Reclaim ID. First of all, Reclaim is a self-sovereign personal data sharing system. And if you, are, if you know about this realm of software, then you may think of other tools that implement similar behavior. Some other ones are, for, inst for, are for instance, Sovereign, Uport, or NameID. And um, Sovereign is based on a hyperledger, and it's basically using a permissioned blockchain. And whenever we use a blockchain, then we cannot make it free anymore because at some point there's a fee to pay. So this was not a good option for um, for the project that we wanted to create. Uport is using Ethereum, which is also a, blo a blockchain. And another downside is that um, the data could not be accessed anymore if the user was offline by third parties that, want, that actually should share the data. And um, name ID had some good ideas which were actually taken for um, additional steps that we took. But um, the main downside at this point was that all the access had to be performed through one central service, uh, one central server, and this is, this is a limitation. And we wanted to create Reclaim in such a way that um, we do not require a blockchain. It should be fully decentralized, and it should be possible to access the data of the users in an asynchronous way. So basically, in a nutshell, um, Reclaim ID is, first of all, a decentralized directory service, and it's combined with cryptographic access control. Those are the main elements. Okay. 
Most of you probably already know directory services. If you think of the X.500 standard, you may, you may know LDAP or Active Directory, which is a commonly used um, directory service in Windows systems. And you already know um, name systems, for instance, like DNS, which is the domain name system. Whenever you look up a website like um, google.com or whatever, it translates the name to a given IP. And um, the interesting thing is, using these namespaces, you don't, um, it's not only possible to save IP addresses and um, strings or whatever, but you can actually save a lot more different kinds of data in these systems. And um, the decentralized directory service that we are using is heavily based on the GNU name system, which in the following part of the talk is abbreviated as GNS. And um, the GNU name system basically allows you to perform an NS lookup. For instance, um, check up email.bob.org, who is this? And the answer will be, this is the email that is um, located there. And um, the great thing about the GNU namespace, uh, about the GNU name system, is that it natively supports the encryption and the digital signature of certain resource records. And um, we can use these features to protect the identity data from unwanted disclosure. And um, we can actually enforce control using these features. OK, so how does it actually work? What you can see here is basically a scheme which um, consists of three main parties. On the bottom left, you see the user, which has a browser plugin installed in the web browser that is being used, and um, is able to locally set up a reclaim identity. So um, the plugin is installed, it's started, and the user is able to um, create a new identity with maybe a name like uh, the typical name John Doe or whatever, his email address, and a date of birth. The second party, party which is involved is basically the decentralized directory, which you can see in the, at the top in the middle. And this is where we store the information of our identities in an encrypted way so not anybody can get access to the information which is saved over there. And, and on the bottom right, you actually see the website which is demanding to receive an identity via the Reclaim ID system. OK, so um, there are some slides now which contain a bit of math. And um, some people might get overwhelmed by, by these figures. Some other people are, are interested in the cryptography. How does it work actually in detail? If this is um, not so interesting for you, that's okay. You can just take the following slide for granted. But um, I, I, I want to give a quick, in, a quick deep dive on the crypto that is being used. Okay, so in the GNU name system, a namespace is defined by a public and a private elliptic curve key pair. So um, we need the following things. We have a generator of the curve which is G, we have an, uh, a group order prime number, which is N, we have a private key, which we denote as X, and we have a public key, which is basically X, G, modulo N. And um, using this private key and this public key, we can derive additional keys from this original key ma key ma keying material, and we use this these derived keys to encrypt and sign our resource records. Afterwards, the encrypted records are published in a distributed hash table under a key called Q. Uh, you can see it in practice later. And um, it is important to note that any peer is able to verify, first of all, the signature as the corresponding derived public key is also published. So um, it's always possible to check the signatures. And the records can only be resolved and decrypted if the true identity and the label is known. 
So um, the main point at this point is basically just uh, namespace cannot be enumerated. You cannot guess them. You need, you need to get specific information to retrieve information out of these namespaces. And um, it's impossible to, I mean, it, it, you cannot um, observe the queries or responses. Unless you, unless you know the label and the identity. So, OK. So first, a user creates a namespace using a private key and a public key. And this is basically the namespace where he, uh, the user can store his personal identity information inside. And this is the data structure which is created in the end. You see here a table. You have three columns. The first column is the label. The second column is the record type. And the third column is the value. And um, the labels, which you can see on the first column, this is a random secret value with a very high entropy. You cannot guess this information, but you need this information to actually get the value which is um, saved. For instance, um, if I want to receive the value, my email is alice at example.com, then you can only access, this, access it if you know the label for email. OK, so this resource, re resource record is stored in an encrypted way in the decentralized service. And um, this is another um, crypto slide. If, you, if, if we have a namespace given using the private key X and the public key P, then we perform the following actions. First of all, we define H to be a hash of the label that is used and the public key P. Afterwards, we create our, dis our distributed hash table key, which is uh, Q defined to be the hash of the previously hash again with the public key. And we um, derive our encryption key K, which is, a, which is another hash of a label and P. And um, using this keying material, we can actually encrypt our records. And um, another variable is used for the signature. D is defined to be H, X, modulo N. So basically, in a nutshell, all you need to access the information is the label and the public key. If you have, t if you have th uh, these two things, then you can Main, and then you can get all the access that you need. OK, in practice, what is going on now? Basically, the website demands a login using the identity provider. And the reclaim, I use, uh, the reclaim, uh, reclaim ID uh, wants to access, wants to grant access to um, an, a certain identity. And the website downloads the information which is required from the decentralized directory. And um, in practice, this is what happens. So we have our information stored in the, uh, in the decentralized service. And um, whenever a user grants access to a certain set of attributes, an additional entry must be given. So what you can see here is basically um, next to the main attributes which were added, we see another line, which is basically um, labeled with the label ticket. And we can see the record types are attribute references. And um, each, for each authorized party, such a reference record is added. And um, the label L ticket can now be shared with any third party. In order, to ex uh, in order to authorize the access to the email and the date of birth. And um, this layer of indirection, well, basically, the third party does not receive the label email and the label name and the label of date of birth directly, but indirectly. This um, allows us to revoke tickets if we do not use them anymore. So in practice, the website downloads the stored information. Since it knows L ticket, it is able to retrieve the information, how it can find um, the date of birth and the name. And afterwards, the information can be used. And here, at the decryption process, it's basically the same. Again, we perform a hash of the label and the public key. And again, we create our queue, which is 
a hash of the previously created hash again with the public key. And um, also on this side of the server, the key to decrypt all the information, K is also get generated. And in the end, um, this way, if the server knows the label and the public key, the resource records can be decrypted and used and validated. So um, for all attributes that the server wants to download or the service, um, this step of decryption and checking the values is repeated. Okay, now the interesting thing is, okay, um, we just have given a third party access to our identity information. But what happens if we want to revoke it? What happens if I do not longer want to share certain attribute, uh, attributes with some services? And this is where this um, layer of interaction comes in very handy. So here basically we see again, um, we have our main attributes which were stored and saved by the client in the beginning. And we have two services registered in our decentralized service, um, which is basically a service called Alice and a service called Bob. OK. Now we want to revoke the access for the service called Alice. And basically, we simply just um, delete the label that was used to access the information for Alice. The problem, of course, is um, since Alice beforehand knew what the label of email and label of date of birth was, Alice would, would still be able to access the label. Um, it would still be able to access email and um, date of birth. So we have to update the, uh, the original labels for the attributes. And at this point in time, um, the service Alice can no longer access the email or the name or the date of birth because it is important um, that this, any service that wants to access the identity information must know the label. And of course, if we want to maintain uh, in the position where we want to let other third parties um, keep, ex uh, keep getting access to our um, email name and date of birth, for instance, their labels which are, which are um, accessible need to be updated. This is why in this slide you can see that um, the label for Bob, um, the information that Bob can access using the label for Bob, uh, must be updated too. And the, the, the interesting part is that for this step, no interaction is, in, is required with a third party. Okay, so this is basically how it works. And the reason why the only thing that you need is the label, this is just given by the GNU name system. That's the main feature that is um, provided. Okay, so Reclaim ID implements the Open ID Connect protocol, which is a very widely used standard. And it's already used by websites which um, integrate any other identity provider, like uh, Google or Facebook and so on. And um, the interesting part is for the end users, the registration process and um, the behavior is completely transparent. That means it's the same. All the crypto cryptographic background things that happen um, are hidden for the user. OK, time for a quick demo. What you can see here is basically um, a website. And on the right hand top, you see basically we visited the website. and. Um, the user which is shown is anonymous. That basically means we are not logged in at this point of time. And we see it's a message board. So basically someone like John Doe posted a message and the website um, allows us to click a button called Reclaim ID. And, you, and by clicking this button, a prompt is created. And this is um, handled by the plugin that must be installed in the browser. And um, Basically, the plugin asks us, oh, wait a moment. The website Reclaim ID Demo Message Board wants you to 
use Reclaim ID to authenticate yourself. And um, now I have the option to decline the request or select an identity which I stored to allow this service um, to use the identities that I previously put up. And the service wants to, wants to know my email and my full name. So afterwards, I click I want to choose my identity. And basically, I previously set up two identities, which I can choose from. One is Johnny. But Johnny has not um, the sufficient amount of attributes. And John Doe, of course, um, has the information which is required. And I can click this um, share from this identity button. And basically, um, the user behavior is just like logging in with Facebook or Google. And in the end afterwards, after I chose to use my John Doe identity, um, as you can see in the top right corner, um, I am logged in as user John Doe. And this all happens without um, a third party being involved or someone else having control over my login process. OK, wait a moment. And what's the time? OK, okay. so far, um, the interesting thing is that um, sometimes you do not just need certain attributes like name or email. Sometimes it's important to use sets of information which were validated by a third party, like a state governmental thing or some other piece of information. Sometimes we still need third parties to um, validate trust on certain claims that we make. And um, some identity providers like Facebook or Google, they implicitly provide this assurance for some um, attributes. And um, the big problem is that those parties are actually not the full authority over the information that um, is being shared. For instance, whether your real name is actually the name that you post on Facebook or whether your phone number is the one that you actually use or, or, or whatsoever, that cannot be asserted there. And um, what we basically need in the everyday life of identity providers is um, often we need a collection of different credentials. And um, these credentials are issued by a variety of different entities. For instance, um, if you want to log in at a state website, you need um, a validated piece of information about your date of birth, about your residence, or things like that. And the concept which is um, um, the, the, the difficult part is basically at this point, um, we want to preserve the privacy of these credentials while still um, offering them to some services. And um, one approach of performing these things is um, zero knowledge proofs. And um, the thing that we are currently working on as the next features um, is basically one of the new features of OpenID Connect. It's called aggregated claims. That basically means that you can combine different attributes and identity information pieces um, into one big claim. So this is it. And that's what we are working on right now. Um, OK, how can we actually use Reclaim ID? First of all, you can install the web extension. It's built for Mozilla Firefox. Um, if you check out the add-on um, market, you can just search for Reclaim ID. And um, you have to install GNU-NET. And um, you need at least the version 0.12. And in case you want to install it bare hands, then you might get a bit frightened because you have to perform a lot of steps. But that's um, OK. There also exist some containers which allow to use uh, the GNU-NET system. And um, we are working on making it easier, of course. OK, so, so in summary, um, you can get all the information about the Reclaim Identity project at reclaim-identity.io. A demo website exists where you can just um, check it out, create your identity, and um, test it. There are two demos. One is demo.reclaim-identity.io, and another demo is um, available at eusec.clauditor.io. 
And um, the roadmap basically um, contains the following steps for the next things. We want to make it more user-friendly in the packaging of the GNU net. Um, may it, maybe it, be pos it, it may be possible to ship GNU net inside a browser plugin. And um, the version 1.0 of this tool is um, coming soon, about to finish. OK. Um, since my colleague is the leading programmer of this, of this project, and, you ha and if you have complex questions, please just um, send an email to him, and he can um, give the best answers, of course. Here, here is his um, public key and stuff like that. So if you have any questions, please, please um, feel free to ask them. Thank you. And if you have any questions that you want to pose now, just raise your hand and I will give you the microphone. Uh, so first of all, I want to say it sounds like a really great project. I wanted to know how it compares to Tim Berners-Lee Project Solid. Is it in any way comparable? Um, to me, the problem is I personally have not checked out Sovereign yet. Um, Solid. Solid. Solid, yeah. yeah. Okay. And the thing is just, if you send us an email, we can provide you the information. And on the project side, there are some scientific papers where you can look it up in detail, what has been compared. Um, I wanted to know, couldn't just Alice or like the other party save the data? And then even if I revoke my label, they still keep my data? Well, but then we would not keep control. We want to be able to um, change our data and we want to be able to revoke access to our um, point of maintainability. We want to maintain all of our information at one point, and we want to be able to say our data cannot be accessed anymore. So, um, of course, the website can keep a copy of the information which was stored. That can always be the case. You cannot control that anyways. If you release information, it can be recorded or in any way. But um, the advantage is that some websites, if they do not have to keep the information, which is um, privacy related at the same website, then they do not have to suffer from general data protection regulation issues or things like that. So it's, an, it's a feature to a website to be able to access the information of a user at any time, even if the user is offline. <laughs> Another follow um, do you plan on implementing web of trust? Like other users um, um, vouching for other users' attributes? Like a decentralized kind of authorization thing? <laughs> We're planning on implementing something we call fog of trust, which is a private version of web of trust where the web is not visible to the world. <laughs> That's a great answer. <laughs> That's interesting. So I see more questions here in the back. Raise your hands in the meantime. Uh, when I understood you correctly, so, uh, hi, here, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, that's all stored in the uh, underlying distributed uh, hash table of GNUnet, right? So um, how do you ensure actually that the GNUnet nodes just don't keep copies of uh, the database in an older state so that uh, also the older labels could still be resolved even if uh, you do this indirection thing? I have to be honest, I have to think about that. Um, but if you write us an email, we can answer your question, of course. I mean, you, you touched on a little bit with the, the private FOF, but uh, I guess I have two questions. One, isn't the most important thing with these logins, the most valuable thing, the social graph of connecting between people? And like, who are the other people who use this same application? And then the other is like, it doesn't seem useful to know what you claim your email address is or what you claim your phone number is. I want some person who is not you to verify that you have control of those, those bits of contact information. Mm -hmm. 
So that the thing that you mentioned, that you want to be sure that the information that you propose is validated, this is um, dealt with. Wait a moment, I have to go back on the slide. Mm -hmm. uh. Well, basically, if you want to share validated pieces of information, then you can do this using this technology too. So if you have a set of um, information like, this is my email address, it has been validated by a third party, and, or maybe by multiple parties, these can also be saved and shared in the decentralized directory. Come again, please. <laughs> Can you repeat, please? I guess the question is, do, do those exist? Well, it depends. If you trust a third party, like... No, um, is there code for running an email validator on Reclaim ID? Oh, um, that's what we're working on right now. It's a, it's a part of the aggregated claims feature. Okay, mm -hmm. next question over here. Yes. So, um, you, obviously, there's a possibility to have multiple identities, right? And yep. you, in your proof, um, in the little uh, demo you've shown, you basically two different identities and one identity like the attributes the website required, right? So obviously, um, there is a mapping between your actual labels, um, not, the, not the technical labels, but basically what you had, L, email, L, day of birth, et cetera, et cetera, and the sort of meaningful name for the attribute that the application requires. So how does this mapping actually work? So. I mean, the website basically cares about the day of birth, but they don't know what kind of in internal label you've given. You can codify the day, DOB, day of birth, whatever. So how does this mapping work? Okay. So each user that you create also creates a new namespace. So um, the two users that you could see had two different namespaces. And a namespace is defined by one private key and one public key. And if you, if you um, send the public key to the server and the label containing the ticket information for the third party that you want to give trust or uh, that you want to give access to, if these two things are at hand, then the web server can actually retrieve the information from the decentralized service. So um, let me go back to the slide. Here. Um, this namespace belongs to one identity, but the second identity that I could choose has a completely different namespace and another public key. The only two sets of information which, you, which are required to access um, information about an identity is a label and a public key. And you? The question was, where do the, what is the semantics of the prefixes email name DOB? The question was, what about the semantics of name, email, DOB, where that comes from? And I think it comes from simply from the OpenID standard here. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Indeed. <laughs> Thanks for the help. Okay, thanks. Next question. Next question here. Uh, <clears throat> so question would be more like, isn't your tool making the identity thefts more easy? Because, for example, Facebook accounts, you can create create a fake one and use to post things and you know, various malicious Well, it things. depends on your use case. If you do, no, if you do not want um, a third party to know whenever you are giving access to a certain website or whenever you are visiting a certain website and you want to take a decentralized approach, this is a good option. But of course, you can make up um, fake accounts. Of course, you can put up any information that you want. But if you want to add information that was attested by another third party, you can do this as well. So the main focus is about getting the identity monopoly, um, the identity oligopoly away from the big um, identity providers and form something independent. Um, sounds pretty nice, but I fear you're running into a scale up problem um, regarding performance. So, presume one billion people are using your service. Um, what time do you t intend, does it take to, to update the whole decentralized uh, network? Well, I think that's a big question for the GNU name system. Um, can you dive in? 
Well, DHTs uh, exist that scale logarithmically to the number of nodes, so the performance uh, can scale. I mean, you've seen Cademlia and, or CAT for, used for BitTorrent. Uh, so these can scale to very large networks. I'm not claiming that the current implementation in GNU-NET scales to that level, um, but I think by the time we get to a billion users, we'll address that problem as well. At least in theory, the complexity, you know, the big O is manageable. Thank you so much. So the next one over here. Yeah, just uh, shortly picking up on the question from uh, the person over there. So he asks, doesn't it make uh, identity theft easier? And um, you said, yeah, of course you can create like other identities, no worries. Um, I think the other part of the question is, um, how do you uh, handle, well, of course you don't handle, but uh, um, I mean, you have an important aspect of, of end user device security in there. So I would assume that stealing uh, identities from end user devices might be easier actually than stealing them from Facebook. I'm not sure, um, but do we uh, address that issue somehow or? Uh? People try to understand the question, I think. <laughs> Um, the idea is basically, oh, okay. If I've stolen your end user device, don't you think I usually get your Facebook account with it? Not in your case, you don't use Facebook, I know. <laughs> um, yeah, well, of course, um, since the management of the identities is handled locally on the, web, uh, on the laptop, um, well, you have to manage it somewhere, but uh, if you post the information in the web, um, I mean, if you, post the in if you put the information the in the decentralized service, you can only access, access it if you have the label and the public key. So the weak point that you, you are saying is, um, since I can now handle my identities on my laptop, um, the weak point is that my laptop is at hand and um, I can steal information from my laptop. Well, okay. Um. Well, actually, uh, I was more yeah. like uh, asking if you already did consider integrating some uh, like security tokens or something like that, so uh, you can like uh, outsource it from from the laptop or something like that. Yeah, you can you can do that too. Currently, I don't think that's uh, implemented. Okay. Well, that's a nice suggestion. Thank you. Uh, I. I would be eager to use uh, Reclaim IT today uh, as an end user, um, but I'm afraid I cannot. Or I, it's only the demo websites, but I cannot use it, for example, to log into a GitLab installation or so. Yes, that's a good point. But um, this login ID button, I mean, Reclaim ID uses the OpenID Connect protocol, and it should be, ver it should be fairly easy for websites to implement it to offer their feature to use Reclaim ID. So I, I need to ask the service, uh, the, the uh, provider of the instance uh, to implement it. And then I can come with my Reclaim ID. Um, they don't have to implement it, they can use the things that are provided. Okay, but they have to integrate it, like they mm -hmm. have to add another Open ID provider. Yes, indeed. Uh, okay, thanks. Okay. We seem to have tackled all the questions. Um, do you still want to say something? <laughs> okay. Oh, no, I'm sorry. I'm very sorry. Are you okay? <laughs> I hope. So, I will recover at least. <laughs> so, thanks so much again for this presentation. Um, we have the contact information here again, uh, if anybody has more detailed uh, questions, of course. Um, and also, uh, you said the version 1.0 will be published soon, so we can all dive into it more and talk to our uh, services that we want to use to implement um, this part of OpenID. Okay. Yes, indeed. And I want to mention one more time, the main programmer is Martin Schanzenbach. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. <laughs>